box. Lydia, show them where the box is. That box. So I want to start out by thanking Rich and Lydia, who are going to help me with the presentation. Because the presentation is taking a bearing and using a bearing. You guys don't want to see me use a laser pointer. My hand is shaking. Well, I'll be nervous by the time I'm done. Um, so the presentation is going to be about taking a bearing and using a bearing uh, on a compass, which Rick showed on a compass, or on a map. So in the field or on a map. So Rich and Lydia have nicely agreed to help me out so we can help distinguish between the things that we're talking about. We're going to come back to finding the uh, three arrows in just a moment. So what the workshop is about is taking a bearing from north. And the problem is there's two norths, right? There's a magnetic north, which Rich is going to be dealing with, and there's a true north that Lydia is going to be dealing with. So in the field or on the map. And that's what we're going to be talking about. If any of you came to this presentation last year, I actually did Rich's topic, taking a bearing in the field, on one workshop, and Lydia's topic, taking a bearing on the map, in a second workshop. And this year, I only got one workshop to do it, so I combined them together. If you're interested in declination, which would be taking a bearing from the field with magnetic north and trying to use it on a map, the true north, that's called true juice. Because you got apples for true or magnetic north and oranges for true north, and you end up with fruit juice. That's better known as declination. How many people are interested in declination? Great, I'll see you next month. Because that's what we're talking about next month is declination. So when you're trying to take a piece of information that you get from the field and use it on the map, you got a problem because you have two different norths. So tonight, we're not going to worry about taking something from over here in the field and using it on the map. What we're going to do tonight is take it from the field and use it in the field. So apples to apples. Or take it off the map and use it on the map, so oranges to oranges, okay? Next month is fruit juice, declination. Okay, so we have to start out talking about what is a bearing. So, I don't know, there might be some of you cringing right now seeing that tool up there called the protractor from math class. It's just a tool to measure up uh, an angle. So, um, a bearing is nothing more than the measurement of an angle. We're gonna measure from our zero over to whatever angle you want to get the value of, and you'll measure clockwise. So what's the measurement of this angle? Oh, I love it when the answer's in the slide. So good job. So a bearing is nothing more than a measurement of an angle in degrees. And maybe you've used a protractor in your past. Um, if not, you can see how we work here. We need a baseline to put our zero on. The red line is representing our baseline. So that's just what a bearing is. It's just a fancy name for an angle. So um, we need an angle. Let's say that Rich is going to point to the back wall and he wanted to take a bearing. So you point to the back wall. And um, let's, well, actually, let me change my scenario. Let's look at this scenario over here. Let's pretend that Rich is standing up on a ridge line. And he's lost. But over there, way up high, given that he's way up high, he can look down and he can see a road. And he can take a bearing to that road. But in a moment, he's going to start walking in that direction, which means he's going to go down in the trees. And when he goes down in the trees, he's not going to see the road anymore, right? What the bearing is going to do for him is to keep him from going around in circles. Because they say when you're lost, you can go in circles. What the bearing will do is give him this number, this bearing, for him to follow. So hopefully he'll go in a straight line, or at least head in that direction over there. So all the bearing's going to do is keep him going in that direction versus over there, or over there, or in circles, as they say when you want. Okay? So that's the purpose of our bearing. Okay, so to measure a bearing, we need two things. We need a baseline to measure from, 
which will be this red line here. If you remember in my prior slide, the red line was at zero. So we need a baseline and we need a protractor. And the protractor is going to give us two things. It's going to give us the ability to say where we want to go, the angle we want to measure, and it's going to give us zero. <coughs> so the yellow is my zero, the cyan is where we want to go. So we need two things, a baseline and a protractor. This really is about compasses, not math class. This is going to connect to a compass. Okay, so how do you measure a bearing? We're not playing with the compass yet. We'll get there in just a moment. Got to lay the foundation. First thing is we need to determine your baseline. Let's pretend that's the baseline. And what a baseline is, is something that we know will be there always. It's not going to move. Because if Rich measures a bearing from a zero, our baseline, and he has to stay on that bearing, that means zero can't move. Because if zero moves, the 120 is going to move, right? So our baseline has to stay put. So just pretend that that's going to stay put. I labeled it as a work. Then what we need to do is point in the direction we want to go, which is like my little man. He's pointing his nose where he wants to go, and the cyan line is where he's planning on going. Okay? And now we need to align our tool for measurement, which is this protractor. So we're going to take the yellow part, which points to zero, and align it with our baseline. Cute, huh? That takes a long time. Thank you. Anyway, and then the next step is we're going to measure. So we need to point, then we need to align to our baseline, and then we need to measure and get some number. Okay, just remember those steps. Believe it or not, I'm going to relate this to a compass before we're done. Okay, so to measure a bearing, just to repeat, we need a baseline and we need a protractor. So how does that relate to a compass? The baseline, and we'll come back to this in a moment, is going to be our north. We won't dwell on this right now, but just keep in mind, it's going to be north. Because will north move? Well, they say magnetic north moves slightly over a certain amount of time, but we can pretty much rely on it staying put. And then on a map, you have to use your imagination. This is a map. Okay? This is a road. This is a line of trees. This is where we get to be creative tonight. So, on a map, where is north? At the top. Right, on top of maps, north would be on the top. So, just pretend that this is a map, so we know north will be up here. So, what would be our baseline? The edge of the map. So, our baseline is going to be the edge of the map, because the edge of the map is uh, straight and it's parallel to pointing up to the top of the map. So my red line, whenever you see a red line, that's our baseline. When you see a yellow line, that's going to be our zero. And when you see a cyan line, that's going to be the direction we want to go in. At the cough, excuse me. <coughs> How does one cough at this thing? I guess take it off and get idea. There are three arrows on the compass, so now we get to play with the compass. You get to find them. Look at your compass and find three arrows on there. Okay, anybody yell out where an arrow is? Where's an arrow on the compass? Which one? On the plastic? Ooh, excellent. You're doing them in order. Look at that, that's great. Okay, we call that the direction of travel arrow. It's the arrow, see the rectangle? The plastic? On that plastic is what we call the direction of travel arrow. And this compass is wore out, so I got to redraw it in with a marker. That's my cyan line. That's the direction you want to go in. Okay? It looks different on different compasses. Here's three more compasses. This compass over here, has a magnifying glass in the middle of it. And by the way, this direction of travel arrow intersects the dial that we're going to have to read.
three. Okay. And this one, you do. Yes, you barrel down. It looks just like that. That's the direction of travel arrow. It's a small one. It's short. But it's still what you're going to point where you want to go. And this compass over here wants to challenge us. Because they gave us two directions of travel arrow. And this thing actually serves two purposes. One, it tell, we point it where we want to go. Oh yeah, there's it on there. We point it where we want to go. And where it intersects the dial is where we want to read the dial. So this one is confusing the heck out of us. No. Because no, you don't read here and here and divide them in half and divide by two. I guess that would work. But who wants to do math? Um, so you would read, this one has a little triangle on it. I don't know if you can see the little plastic triangle. And some of the compasses actually have words on it that say, read here. <laughs> Seriously. Anybody got one of those here? Yeah, it says read here. Okay, so you see the purpose of the direction of the travel arrow? You point it where you want to go, and where it intersects the dial, that's where you're going to read. So that was very good that you found that one. There are two more arrows in the compass. Anybody find them? Yeah. The needle. The needle. I'm going to save that one for last. But yes, the floating needle in there. What's that do? What's that do? Yeah. Right. It shows where magnetic north is. Great. Do you know where the other arrow is? Yes. Good. I'm going to do that one next. We call it the orienting arrow. It's painted on the compass. If you turn that dial, it moves. It points to what? What number on the dial does it point to? Zero. That's my yellow line. That's what you're going to be aligning to your baseline. So I drew it in yellow. And notice on the left or right of it, probably both, um, it has parallel lines to it. That comes in handy when you need to line up on the map. That's called the orienting arrow. It's painted on it. When you turn the dial, it moves with it. Everybody find that one on your compass? Okay. It might look different on other compasses. Like on this compass, it's, it doesn't have an arrow. It's got two glow-in-the-dark markers on the north end and one glow-in-the-dark marker on the south end, but it points to zero. And you can see there's only one parallel line on either side. In this compass, it's painted on the bottom, and there's no parallel lines to the side of it. And red means what? North. North and black means south. But this one doesn't have red or black on the painted arrow that's on the housing, on the dial. And this one, it's got, it looks like a, house shape. The arrow, again, pointing north, and it's got two reflective dots on either side of it. So it's going to look different based on what compass you have. You have that one again? Yes. The one in the middle? Yes. Um, that is my yellow line, which points to zero. That is the orienting arrow that we're going to use uh, to, to, when we turn the dial, we're going to make use of that, that arrow. And then the third arrow, this young man who pointed out over here, is the arrow that points to magnetic north. Right, Lydia has it over here. So, one thing to keep in mind with this, when you need to use this arrow, red points to north. Okay? If you use the black end, you're going to be going 180 degrees in the wrong direction. So make sure you use the red end. It changes what it points to on the dial, right? Because it floats. It lines up with magnetic north, the pole of the Earth. Um, it floats so it can pivot freely. And our last bullet up there, so important, I made it dance. That magnetic needle, the reason why I did that as the third arrow is because we're only going to use it in ridges scenario. That arrow, you can rip out when we do the map scenario. It does not play a role over here when you take a bearing on the map. Okay? Only when you take a bearing in the field. So three arrows. We need all three arrows. Oh, we have a couple more magnetic needles. This one's kind of fat with a reflective tip on it. 
Oh, it doesn't have a black sound then, it has white. You got that one? Okay. I bet you have this one. It's got a white end. And then this one's got the black end. But that's that floating needle in there. Yep. Yours is always in the middle of these slides. Okay. So, now we're going to connect those three arrows to this slide which is how do those arrows of the compass match up with how we take a bearing. So, your direction of travel arrow, the one on the base plate, that rectangular piece, that matches up with this part of my prior slide. That's where we want to go. Okay? The second arrow, the oriented arrow, the one painted on the bottom of the housing, that's the one that turns. This is what it is on the compass. This is where it was when we were talking about how to measure a, bear, a bearing. It points to zero. <clears throat> and it's, we want to measure from here to here. So somehow we need to measure from here to there. We'll figure out how to do that in just a moment. And then the third arrow, notice we only use it in one of our cases for the baseline. So that magnetic needle that's floating around in there is our baseline. And we only use it when we're taking a bearing in the field, so Rich's scenario. We don't use it when we're taking a bearing off the map, which is Lydia's scenario. Because over here, our baseline is the edge of the map, which points north, right? So we got our baseline, and now we know where that is on the compass and when we're going to use it. The floating needle is our baseline. These two things, are our protractor. That's why they call that type of compass a protractor compass. Who would know? In fact, the compass is better than the protractor you used in math class. Because a protractor in math class measures from 0 to 180, half a circle. A compass measures from 0 to 360, a full circle. So these two lines on your compass, both of which are painted on your compass, are the protractor. They're going to do the measurement for you. The floating needle is your baseline, sometimes, when you're in the field, not when you're in the Everybody think? So far? <clears throat> Maybe. Because I'm sure you're thinking, okay, we got it. We got the arrows. We got that one arrow is the baseline and the other two arrows are the protractor. But now what? Oh, so there you are. Now that we know what the three arrows are, how do we use them? So here we go. This is how you use the compass to take a bearing. So remember this slide we started out with how to measure a bearing? The first thing is determine your baseline. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, am I in the field or am I on a map? Because if you're in the field, you're going to use the floating needle on your compass. That's your baseline. If you're on the map, true north is at the top, and you're going to use the edge of the map. Or some maps have parallel lines drawn on them. You can use any one of those parallel lines. They all point up to north. Okay? So now that we know our baseline, that's pretty easy, right? You either know you're standing in the field, or you're looking at a map. So then what? So now that we got our baseline figured out, now we're going to learn how to take a bearing. I hope I got that back on. So we're going to just, this is kind of a review. We need to point in the direction of travel. So Rich, to me a bear, point in your direction of travel. He's going to point to the back wall. His nose goes with the compass. He has to hold the compass correctly. We'll come back to it. And then we have to do the alignment. The alignment is turning the compass. We're going to come back and see this in detail. But no, what he's doing is he's standing put, right? Because if he moves, He's changing where he wants to go. So he's standing put and he's changing the compass. And then we're going to read the number. See the three words in bold? This is a great way to remember how to do this. What do those three 
the first letter of each of those three words spell? Pan. Okay. Just remember P-A-N, and you got it. That's how you take a bearing. You point, you align, and you read a number. Okay, so let's see that in detail. Okay? So this is what we call taking a bearing, which means we're going to measure a bearing. Remember, point, align, number. And this is how we're going to use the, the components of that protractor on the compass to measure a bearing. So no more protractor pictures for just a minute. And we're going to do it in both cases. So you notice Rich is standing on that side because in the field it's on the right side of the slide. And Lydia is standing on the left side because how to do this on the map is on the left side. So I'm going to show you how to do both at the same time, because it's actually the same thing. All that's different is the baseline. Okay, we're going to start with Rich. No, we're going to start with Lydia, because when I hit click, that's what's going to happen. So what she's going to do is we want to take a bearing off a map. So we're going to assume that Lydia's at A. So she's going to put the back corner of the compass on A. And you know what? It doesn't. A to B. It doesn't matter if it's this corner or this corner. What matters is that A and B are along the same side. Okay? Because would you agree with me that this side of the compass is parallel to our direction of travel? Yeah. Yes. So, we're not going to assume that the side is our direction of travel. It's parallel to this. Okay. So, she's going to go from A to B. And notice her side doesn't reach B, so you gotta eyeball it, okay? And uh, so she pointed the direction of travel towards B. Oh, yeah, she's gotta make sure that this direction of travel arrow points from A to B, because that's where she wants to go. If she had this pointing the other way, she would be going from B to A. We wanna go from A to B. Hopefully everything won't fall off our map over here. All right, so on the slide, it looks like this. You connect A to B, they have to be on the same side. Everybody good? That's the P. Point to where you want to go. That's how you do it on a map. In the field, Rich turns his body and faces where he wants to go. So he wants to go to those bleachers back there. So he takes his whole body and he has to hold the compass correctly. A little more tricky over here because he can't be messing up my right more. So you want to hold it level. It's usually good to hold it by like your belly button so you can look down. And uh, very important, keep it away from anything magnetic. Like the bolts on the picnic tables at Menden Ponds Park. Really bad to do this workshop on those picnic tables. Because the company you put all the compasses on the picnic tables in north is like every which way. Um, you don't want to put the compass next to another compass. You want to see two needles go wacky, put two compasses next to each other. They probably go boom. That. Um, old watches, you know, mechanical watches, not the digital ones. Mechanical. Don't try using one of these in the car. I tried it one time. You know what? North is always where the engine is. As soon as you turn on the car, these compasses are going to point to where your steering wheel is. So you got to keep it away from anything magnetic. So Rich is going to use his nose and hold the compass directly, point to where he wants to go. Oops. And his purple line goes right through the middle because he's holding it. So he's aligning his nose with the direction of travel pointing to where he wants to go. Everybody good with that? That's P. Oh, I got both this. So now you gotta align it. On the map side, the alignment is you're gonna turn that. Whoa. Both way. On the map side, we're going to turn that dial so that this arrow, which points to zero, lines up to this. Now we're not going to put that on top of it. We're just going to make it so they look parallel. There. That now lines up with our baseline. Okay? You good? So she's lining it up and make sure north points to the north. On Rich's side, He's going to turn the dial until that painted arrow underneath the floating arrow lines up. 
He just aligned his zero to his orienting arrow to the magnetic morph. Right? So now, over here on Lydia's side, on the map side, we're going to measure clockwise all the way around here. The measurement will be right here. And on Rich's side, clockwise from, I don't know, it's hard to look at this. This way around to here. No, this one's from here to here, right? You can see it better from where you are. This one is 230, so it's going to measure from here over to here. And this one is 62, it's going to measure from here to here. That's the measuring of the angle. So now you know how to take a bearing on both the map and on the compass. So what you do at this point now is you read the number right here. See where that arrow is blinking and that arrow is blinking? It's where your direction of travel intersects the dial. That's where you read the number. Make sense? Okay. So this is how you take a bearing. P A N. Point, in Rich's case, it's him physically pointing. In Lydia's case, it's lining up the edge, connecting the two dots of where you want to, where you are, where you want to go. Align. Align the orienting arrow, which is the one on the zero that's painted, to the baseline. Which is in this case, or in Rich's case, magnetic north. In Lydia's case, true north. Jackson would be, if Rich pointed right to Jackson, it would be north. And he pointed to Larry, it's how much? 330 degrees. 330 degrees. Yep. And you do this, this is the key part, you do this by turning the compass housing. You turn the housing. Because you want to turn that yellow arrow, that one painted on the bottom of your housing, to be underneath your baseline. In that case, it's underneath the magnetic needle. In this case, it's parallel with the edge of the map. That's how you take a bearing. Point and line number. Easy, right? Once you get the idea of a baseline and your protractor, it's just point and line number. Okay, so what do you do with the compass? Oh, I gotta back up. <clears throat> when you point, like in Rich's case, or even on the map, it's really not a good idea to point to a point. A compass has a difficult time getting you to a point, unlike a GPS. Because if Rich is standing there, who are you pointing to? Larry? And I'm standing here, and I'm pointing at the same angle, am I going to be pointing at Larry? No. But I'm on the same bearing. So we can be standing anywhere over here, and if we take up to a point, there's nothing that, let me back up a minute. Rich could be standing where he is, and he could take a bearing to Larry. But if he comes across a big pond, and he has to move way over here, is that same bearing going to get him to Larry? No. A compass can't get you to a point, but what it can do is take you to an area. So aim for, like, a grove, or a grove of trees, something long, a river. Because no matter what you have to step around to get there, if you go in that same direction, you will hit something that's long. You'll hit the river. You'll hit the ridge line. You'll hit the road. But it's very difficult that you can get to a point. So I had Lydia do a bad thing here. I should have had her go from A to the road. Does that kind of make sense? It's called lateral drift when you move off. If Rich stayed right there and aimed towards Larry and could walk directly from there over, he could probably get to Larry, right? But he's going to have a problem with these chairs. So he's going to shift over here and go on the same bearing. He's not going to get to Larry anymore, but is he going to get to the wall where Larry was? Yeah, so you get to the general direction. So now what do you do with a bearing? So you got this bearing, let's say, what was your bearing to 330? So take a bearing to the back wall, so we don't teach bad habits. Take a bearing to a point, take it to the back wall.
295. So now he's got this bearing, 295. What is he going to do with it? Well, maybe he wants me to go in that direction also. So he would tell me the bearing is 295. And now I need to use that bearing to get me to go in the exact same direction. So how would I use it? Or on the map, let's say you don't have a map with you in the field. Or you don't have a, a, I don't wanna, I'm trying to think of a good scenario here. Let's just pretend that Lydia and I, she's in the kitchen, I'm in the living room. She takes a bearing in the kitchen. She tells me what the bearing is in the living room and I gotta find where she's going on the map. So she has a copy of the map, I have a copy of the map. So how do we use the bearing once we get it? Wow, this looks familiar again, right? First thing that you do is to determine what your baseline is. So if you took the bearing off the map, you're gonna use the bearing on the map where the baseline is true north. Over there, you're gonna use it where the baseline is magnetic north. Now we're gonna reverse it. Watch these words. The three words in bold. The first letter put together with the other words spells what? Now. Now. Remember those words, that's how you use a bearing. Number, a line, point. That's how you use a bearing. It's the opposite of how you took the bearing, how you measured it. Point, a line, number. So this is reverse it. Number, a line, point. You just saw the slide do it. So the first thing I'm going to do is dial in the number. So I'm going to identify where the number is on my protractor, my measurement tool. Next thing I'm going to do is align my zero. You notice how I had to move the tool to get to line up with my baseline. And then the next thing you're going to do is go, oh, this is where I want to go. Seems simple, right? <coughs> the tough part is this alignment. Okay, so let's put the pieces together. She's playing. Okay, we're going to turn the compass housing until the specified numbers of degrees are dialed in at the read here part. So Rich dial in 120, Lydia dial in 120. Okay, are you starting at A? Yes. This says you have to start at A. Okay, she's starting at A. Pretend she's starting at A. So, we've dialed in. That's the first step is dial in your number. So that's the end. Is that hard? Everybody dial in 120. Turn the housing until 120 is at the read here point, which is where the direction of travel arrow intersects the dot. Everybody good? Okay, next step. Maybe. Oh, this actually dialed it in. There's 120 there. Now this guy's going to be dialed in over here. Okay, so you can actually turn the housing so that orienting arrow moves. And now, you don't touch that housing, because if you play with the housing, you lose the 120, okay? So the next thing you do is the alignment. So we're going to align with Lydia first. So you got to put a back corner at A, where you currently are. So pretend you're at A, put the back corner back there, and the next good thing to do is put your finger on it. Put your finger on that corner, because you're going to move the whole compass now, hers isn't straight along the back, so what we're interested in is the straight side of the compass. We're going to ignore this whole curved part of the compass. What a pain in the butt that is, having a curved part there. You just want the straight edge. So she wants to go from here, somewhere out here. So she's going to put her finger on this corner, and now she's going to pivot it until, hang on, watch the slide, until this arrow lines up with this arrow. But don't turn this dial, because if you turn the dial, what do you lose? 120, right? What you gotta turn is the whole darn compass. So that's why it's good to put your finger on that corner. Looks like Vicky Mouse does You notice how the arrow's actually changing here. You try creating this slide. Yeah. See this arrow lines up with this one? A is under here. So the direction of travel is, uh, well, we'll get there in just a minute. But now it's, it is aligned. What we are aligning is this 
to the edge of the map, right? By turning the whole compass, not the dial. Right, now on this side, Rich's side. So now Rich gets to do it. Oh, wait. did you do it? Yep. So Lydia turned the whole compass until north with that needle. And on this side, remember, we could just rip that floating needle out of there. It plays no role. So this arrow lines up with the edge of the map. And now on Rich's side, we'll watch the slide first. Um, I made sure that I emphasize this. Turn your whole body with the compass. So hold the compass correctly with your nose, the direction of travel, pointing where you want to go. And now you've got to turn all of that together. So on the slide, it looks like this. Notice his nose is turning too. His whole body is turning. This one only has three. So if you watch Rich, Rich demonstrate. So for him to line up those two arrows, the orienting arrow and the magnetic arrow, he's got to turn his whole body. Okay, that's the A, that's the alignment. Is that it? All right. Then the third step is, hey, that's where you want to go. So on the compass, this is where the arrow lined up. And this is your starting point, so you're going to follow along this edge of the compass. And where you're looking at is somewhere in this direction. I can't tell you exactly where along that line, because a compass doesn't do that unless you have a second bearing that intersects. Triangulation? So where they intersect, you can get a point. But a compass just gives you a vector. It just gives you a line, a direction. And on this side, it's where his nose and the direction of travel point. That's where he wants to go. So Rich is pointing where he wants to go. Over here, we would follow this edge, same edge as A, and somewhere along this path is where we want to go. That's how you use a bearing. Okay? Questions? So review how to use a bearing. Just remember now. Dial in the number if you're Richest scenario, you align your body, you turn your body to align the painted arrow on the dial with the floating magnetic needle. So you've got to turn your whole body. Over here, you dial in the number, then you turn the whole compass, put your finger on a point, pivot it around until the painted arrow is aligned with true north. Notice you're always aligning that painted arrow with your baseline. And then needle over there or the edge of the map over here. Figuring out which baseline you have is correct is important. And then point, once you've done that, whichever way you're pointing, that's where you want to go. So now there's homework. Oh well, wait, questions? No, homework. Okay, well you guys would love this homework. This would be perfect for these two guys. What's your name? Wyatt, Wyatt and your name? Poopy. Okay, Oliver. This is so much better than Poopy. So Wyatt, what Wyatt can do is go into the living room. We did this with Lydia's 10-year-old nephew. Go in the living room and take a bearing to an object in your living room. Wyatt, you can take a bearing to your TV. But don't tell Oliver what you're looking at. And then you mess up the compass, you call Oliver into the room and say, Oliver, the bearing was 135. And Oliver has to figure out what Wyatt was looking at. Okay, it works really great on a rainy day when you have a 10 year old nephew that you need to entertain. And he was able to get it. He was finding the objects we were looking at. Now, if you don't want to do it in your living room, go out, go canoeing, go hiking. When you sit down and take a break, it's a great way to practice this. Sit down. Maybe Rich takes a bearing to some object, messes up the compass, and he says to me, the bearing is 76 degrees. I have to figure out what he's looking at. Now granted, if this was the bearing of, uh, trying to see, of 76 degrees, I could be going like this gentleman here, and Rich will go, nope. And then I have to look along the same line and go, next gentleman, and they'll go, nope. And I'll go, the young lady in the back, and they'll go, yeah. It's something along this line, right? But at least I'm in the right direction. I'm not over here looking at Jackson or, you know, looking back at Larry or whatever. I got the right direction. I now just have to guess the object. So 
Please don't drive each other crazy doing that. We had two friends that would go, it's that tree? No. That hill? No. All right, I give up. What is it? It's that dandelion. Yeah, was that, this, that is a true story. So that's how you can practice. I call it pan and nap. Sit down, take a break, play pan and nap. It's a great way to get an exercise out of it. And that would be in Rich's scenario. So you can do the same thing, same homework on this scenario. Pull out a map. One of you sit in the kitchen. Take a bearing to something. Agree on your starting point. Like you get the map of Menden Ponds Park. Say you're at, um, what stands out of Menden Ponds Park? You're at the lookout shelter. And the person in the kitchen takes a bearing to something, yells to the living room, the bearing is 146, starting at the lookout shelter. What am I looking at? The person in the living room then has to figure out the direction and then start calling out different things along that line. And the other person says, yay or nay, when they finally get it. It's a great way to practice. Okay? That's your homework. Um, I sent the slides. I don't know. Claire, did you? Help with posting these slides up on the web? They're going to happen. I'm not sure if it has. Okay. Yeah. I, I did submit these slides to be put up on the website, so you can have access to the slides of our website. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Barb, the other thing is that it will be on YouTube. Oh, it'll be on YouTube? Oh. Yeah. I should tell some jokes here. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. It'll be on YouTube so you can watch this again. I want to thank Rich and Lydia for helping. I hope it helped that they were showing the two different scenarios since we're combining two things together in one presentation. But here's the cool thing. If you say, well, what if Rich takes a bearing, or let me do it this way, what if Lydia takes a bearing off the map and now wants to give it to Rich who has to use it in the field, how do we do that? That's that fruit juice I was talking about. Because we're taking a bearing based on true north, which is the oranges, and we're trying to use it with magnetic north, which is the apples, and that is the problem of declination. So come back next month and we'll talk about declination. All right? Okay, any questions? Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it.